I was glad when they said unto me, let us go up to the house of our God. Welcome to the worship of God here at Plymouth Church. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are always welcome here. It is the fifth weekend in Lent, and we keep journeying through the wilderness, journeying with Jesus toward Holy Week. We go on this journey trusting that God goes with us. Before we move more deeply into worship today, some announcements about our life together. Today we recognize and bless our high school seniors. What a year to be a senior in high school. Please add your prayers and blessings on their continued journey. Scholarships are available. Applications are now available for the Plymouth Women and Marie Green Scholarships. More information is available on Plymouth's website. One great hour of sharing. We join with our ecumenical partners and continue to collect this special offering for COVID and disaster relief across the nation and around the world. Collection concludes on Palm Sunday, March 28th. You can donate online or send a check attention Nancy Bassett with OGHS in the memo line. The work of your church continues. Council meets for their regular monthly meeting the fourth Tuesday of the month on March 23rd. As always, this is an open meeting and all are welcome to join via Zoom. Find the link on our church calendar. Holy Week is just around the corner. Next Sunday, March 28th, is Palm Sunday. In addition to our regular online worship, we will gather in person at 1130 for a palm procession. Bring a healthy, shelf-stable food item to donate as we collect food for DMARC pantries as well. Experience the Stations of the Cross in Plymouth's Gallery now and through Holy Week. Sign up for a time to take in and meditate on this beautiful art. Thursday through Saturday of Holy Week, the Labyrinth will be available for meditative walking from 12 to 6 p.m. each day. Sign up to walk alone or with your bubble. Maundy Thursday, April 1st, worship with us in a pre-recorded service available starting at 5.30 p.m. on Facebook and YouTube. Good Friday, April 2nd, worship anytime accessing our pre-recorded service on Facebook or YouTube starting at 6 a.m. Holy Saturday, April 3rd, we celebrate Easter Vigil in person outdoors. This service is new to Plymouth, but ancient to the Christian tradition. From 7 to 9 p.m., gather to hear stories of our faith by firelight, celebrate baptism and communion, and welcome the coming of Easter. Easter Sunday, worship will be available online as always, and three in-person services will be available outdoors. For these and all in-person services and activities, please register in advance to ensure your spot. People of God, as always, we are a member and friend-supported institution. It is your gifts that make all we do possible. Whatever your gift, we thank you and we thank God for you. Hear these words from the second chapter of Ephesians. By grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Let us join together in worshiping this God who loves us.
Let us join now in the prayer of confession. Holy One, you have called to us, and so we have gathered as your people. Here in your presence, we recognize and confess that we have failed to be faithful to you. We have not loved you with all of our heart, our soul, our strength, and our mind. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we long to turn back to the way that leads to life. For the sake of Jesus Christ, forgive us and free us for life as you intend it. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. My friends, hear and believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are all forgiven. May God renew us, and may God help us to be alive to all that is good and faithful and true. And may we be changed by each experience of God's presence. And now let us pray using the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
So today in the children's message, we are going to talk about rules. And I'll bet that you have some rules at your house. When I was a little girl, one of the rules that I had at my house was that we had to eat at least one bite of everything that was on our plates, which is how I learned how to swallow lima beans whole. Because lima beans, if you've eaten them, they don't feel good and they don't taste a whole lot better than they feel. So just swallowing them whole was a way easier way to do it. When my boys were little, we had a family room that we all shared and it had this big couch that we all sat on. And so one of the rules that they had was that they were not supposed to eat on the couch because when they ate on the couch, they left crumbs. And I didn't like to sit in other people's crumbs. But you know, my boys spent a lot of time on that couch playing their video games and watching movies, and they would get hungry. And so sometimes they would forget about my rule about not eating on the couch. They would forget, or they would just be too hungry to care, or it just didn't seem very important to them. So I sat with a lot of crumbs. The people of Israel had a lot of rules too. God had given them rules in order to help them to live together with each other and in order to live in relationship, in good relationship with God. And some of the rules were great big important rules like uh, you shall not murder people or you shall not steal. Some of the rules were smaller rules and a little harder for us to understand. Like one of my favorites, which is what everybody should do when your ox, which is a big cow, right? What should you do when your ox falls in somebody else's hole in the ground? There were a lot of rules that they had to follow. But Israel was like my boys. They had a hard time with the rules. Sometimes they didn't remember them. Sometimes the rules just didn't seem very important. And so they struggled with the rules. So in today's reading, God says that God is going to write the rules on their hearts. God is going to make it possible for them to keep the rules because they'll just know the rules from now on. They won't have to learn them. They won't have to memorize them. They won't have to think about them. They will just know the rules. God wants to stay in relationship so badly with all of God's people, that God is going to make the rules as automatic as breathing. It's just going to be something that they're able to do. So you still have a lot of parents' rules, and those rules are on you. You need to follow your parents' rules. But when it comes to God's rules, what God is saying, at least in this passage, is that the relationship with God is on God. And God is going to help us follow the rules. Amen. Today we celebrate the journey of faith with participants in Plymouth's senior small group gatherings and senior experience class. The pandemic has challenged all of us this year especially you all as seniors. You've navigated new ways of engaging your education and your extracurricular activities daily, as well as spending a whole lot of time on Zoom or FaceTime or whatever it is you're using to connect with your family and friends and stay connected in that regular way. Your ideas of what to expect 
for your senior year that you'd been growing your whole life had to change on a dime. And you have grown and stretched to meet the challenge of this year. You have done this with humor, resilience, grace, probably some frustration and a few tears and a lot of trust. Parents, you have watched, struggled, adapted, and supported these young adults as yours and their dreams and perceived expectations for this last year have changed. You are constantly reminding them that in the midst of all of this crazy stuff that's going on in the world, they are loved. They got this, and you have their backs. In a sea of unknowns, there are two givens that are before you during this passage of time. The first is that your lives are changing and will continue to change in the days ahead. The second is that you are not alone. God is bigger than you can imagine and is holding you in love as well as the whole community. As a physical reminder that you are loved and you are not alone, our shawl knitting ministry has knit shawls for you, our seniors, to take with you on your new journey. Each year this ministry knits all of these beautiful shawls, each different and unique, just as each of you are different and unique. Parents, if you will please wrap these beautiful shawls around your young adults. May these shawls be a reminder that you, our precious children, are held in love and prayer by a community that will always welcome you back home. Parents, guardians, and godparents, will you repeat after me? And please look into the eyes of your young adult as you, as you do. First, say their name. May you be blessed with an open heart and open mind. With love and forgiveness for yourself and others. May you be blessed with curiosity and courage. Confidence and vulnerability. May you be blessed with a soul that dares to trust in all that is God. Now, young adults, to your parents, stay where you are. And if you will repeat after me to your parents, thank you for your love and support. Thank you for the roots you have given me and the wings to soar. I am a child of God. Thank you for your blessings. Amen. Parents, if we, you will lay hands on your youth, then they can, they can turn around. And also, our congregation that are watching this blessing from home, Please stretch out your hands to offer encouragement and support as these young adults make their way towards graduation and the journey that lies ahead and beyond. And the whole congregation, and you all are the whole congregation too, you can repeat after me in this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. On this day and all the days ahead on this day and all the days ahead. May your home be a place of joy and peace. May your home be a place of joy and peace. And your family truly blessed. And your family truly blessed. From this day on and forevermore. From this day on and forevermore. Amen. Amen. 
Thank you for letting us be part of your journey. From Jeremiah chapter 31 verses 31 through 34. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with my people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it in their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. People of God, will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts 
be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It's the plot of nearly every family sitcom. Parents have children, something is destroyed, someone runs away or does something they weren't supposed to do. And now they're afraid of what is going to happen. There must be punishment, and, it's, and they're expecting it to be harsh. They're going to be grounded for a long time, no playing with friends. They'll have to lose their allowance to pay for the damages. Those scenes of Steve Urkel from Family Matters destroying something at the Winslow house. Carl Winslow yelling, Steve, and then Steve Urkel saying in that nasally voice, did I do that, tends to pop into my head. I don't know about you, but I tend to react in similar ways. I know I'm not supposed to do something, but I do it anyway. I fail to uphold my end of the agreement. I know I'm going to get in trouble, and the other person is going to be angry with me. And you know if you hear your first and middle name, then it's pretty serious. Whenever I heard rushing Johnstone, it was best to hide. But I'm forgetting something. We remember the big fights between Steve and Carl. We remember the moments when we did something wrong. We remember the fight. But how often do we remember the reconciling moment? The moment when all is forgiven. It tends to get lost in the midst of constant thoughts of, am I really forgiven? Is all the water really under the bridge now? I'm still on the edge of my seat, prepared for the grudge to resurface. It is most likely, given historical precedent and ancient Near Eastern custom, the Israelites were waiting for God to pile on the punishment. Earlier in Jeremiah, retributive and cruel rhetoric is common. Literary imagery of male warriors experiencing labor pangs to heighten the sense of agony and despair along with exposure and other heinous crimes as forms of punishment because they forgot God and trusted in lies. The Israelites believed that God was going to remember everything. All the times they sinned and broke the law, and in turn broke the covenant. But when we read further, just a couple of chapters to Jeremiah 31, the rhetoric changes. No longer are we talking divine punishment. Now we're talking about a new day filled with reconciliation, a new start to the relationship between God and the people of Israel and Judah. God takes this new beginning even further by entering into a new covenant with the people. Even though God knows they're the ones who broke the last covenant, God says yet again, I'm not abandoning them. But this new covenant isn't like the last one because it doesn't do any good to enter into the same type of covenant knowing they broke the last one and they'd probably break the new one, too. When I was doing some digging on this text, particularly why this text was included in the lectionary for the fifth weekend of Lent, I learned that this is the Old Testament reading for Reformation Sunday in October. And this moment in Jeremiah is indeed the start of a Reformation. We are reading Jeremiah right now in Lent because we are still waiting for this text to become a reality. 
The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when the law will be within them and will be written on their hearts. And no longer shall they teach one another, for they will all know God. In a Reformation, people and institutions are in a state of change. Rejections and modifications are integral. As in the case of the 16th century Protestant Reformation, there were monumental shifts in the way the church functioned and how people interacted with the church and how religious authorities acted. But the church didn't disappear. The church didn't stop being the church. It just found a new way to be the church. In this moment of reformation in Jeremiah, God didn't stop being God. God didn't forsake us, but God renewed God's commitment with the people. Within the context of our Christian theology and how we approach this text in light of Jesus and in the Lenten season— The words of Jeremiah remind us that there is still work to be done to make this text come alive in its entirety. Yes, God is with us and never leaving us. Yes, God has forgiven us of our iniquities and remembers our sin no more. But the current events and headlines of the past week have shown me that something, something has been written on people's hearts by teachers of the past and present. And it is not God's law. If God's law were truly written on people's hearts, then the summation of the law, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself would be internalized in all of us to the point we wouldn't even have bad news in the press. We wouldn't be having discussions in the universal church about whether women can be ordained. Let's be real. If you can give birth to Jesus, you can preach Jesus. We wouldn't be having discussions in the universal church about the ordination of LGBTQ people or whether a pastor or priest can officiate your wedding or bless your union or discussion in civil society about whether LGBTQ people deserve equal protection under the law. We wouldn't be talking about what we should be doing with the migrants at the border because we would all welcome the stranger and give shelter to the refugee. A response rooted in the law, I might add. We wouldn't have a drastic rise in the number of hate crimes toward minority groups and people of color, particularly toward the Asian American and Pacific Islander communities, which was a result of hateful rhetoric from certain politicians trying to disperse blame for their lack of pandemic preparedness, which then points to a failure in our churches to properly address racism, white supremacy, xenophobia, sexism, misogyny, white fragility, along with the failures to properly address the topics of bodily intimacy, sin, and addiction, addiction, homophobia, transphobia, and I could go on and on. We wouldn't have to say things like stop Asian hate, stop AAPI hate, Black Lives Matter, end violence against women, or love is love because God's law would be written on our hearts and all of us in the world would truly speak and act in such a way that no weapon could be formed or dare to prosper. Let's be real. We are not going to get to that place overnight. But we have been moving closer day by day. 
And in our text, we have a model understanding of how to be in relationship with each other because this model shapes the relationship God has with us. Even, even when we mess up, the covenant still stands. Even when we mess up, fail to write God's law on our hearts and on the hearts of others as teachers and mentors, God forgives us. This is what being in covenant with each other and with God means. At Plymouth and in the wider UCC, we are a covenantal church. As Plymouth members, we take a covenant to be ever mindful of the welfare of my fellow members and promise to walk with them in faithfulness and Christian love and to share in the work. And we don't always live up to that covenant. We don't get it right all the time. But that doesn't mean we stop trying. Jeremiah 31 verses 31 to 34, is enduringly difficult, ongoing work. This isn't a one-and-done thing. As long as Yahweh has been known and people have had free will, we have been in a season of Lent. We haven't just been in a season of Lent since February 2020 as we've been living through a pandemic. We've been doing Lent for years, waiting, working, and wandering. And for this scripture to become a reality, we're going to be in Lent for a while. But do not be discouraged. It is natural and all too easy to find ourselves in the state of mind the apostles were in leading up to Jesus' arrest and crucifixion and post-death. They were afraid. They went into hiding. They were discouraged. In the middle of all that was happening, they forgot that Jesus had told them on a number of occasions that a resurrection day would come. And we wait with great anticipation the resurrection day and the post-resurrection days when the law of love is internalized in all of us and it's acted on without any thought or effort. We are in a relationship with each other. We may all have different personalities and experiences that shape who we are, but we are one human family. Our relationship with God isn't transactional, and neither should our relationships with each other. Everything we say and do should be supportive and uplifting. When the law is written on our hearts, all the baggage that comes with traditional religious hierarchy and the toxic theology that it instills in others will cease. Love is the fulfillment of the whole law. This is the fulfillment of the gospel. This is ongoing work. And together, as a people in covenant with each other, we can work together to move beyond the season of Lent, to live in a season of Easter tide filled with love, peace, and joy forevermore. Amen.
People of God, let us pray, first in silence, making room for God to pray in us and listening for that still small voice. Holy One, we thank you for the beauty of this day, for the promise of spring, for the hope that it portends. We thank you for making us in your image, male and female, a whole spectrum of expression and identity fearfully and wonderfully made. We thank you for the gift of love, holy love, your love for us and your love within us. We thank you for blessing the gift of love between all people, no matter our gender expression or sexual orientation. Because love comes from you, it is always blessed sacred, a holy gift. We thank you, O oh God, for the gift of science, for all that has been researched and studied and learned over the last year, building on all the research and study and knowledge that has accumulated over time and across space. We thank you for the wonder of a vaccine that brings us closer to being able to hug our loved ones and gather as a church. We thank you for the gift of medicine and the healthcare workers who provide it, innovating new ways of treating patients so more healing is possible. We thank you for the availability of public health measures like wearing masks and meeting online and using hand sanitizer everywhere that help protect the most vulnerable among us while the virus still spreads. God, we thank you for prophets like Jeremiah, who in the midst of extraordinary and unimaginable upheaval, speak a word of hope reminding the people that no matter where they are, they are never far from you because you make your home in their hearts. When the news of the day threatens to overwhelm us, whether violence against women and people of Asian descent, word of another virus spike in Europe, divisive politics in the state house, and around the dinner table, Remind us that you are not far from us. That you write your word and make your home in our hearts. Help us to sit with you there, O oh God, through the dark nights until morning breaks full of joy. We pray all this in the name of Jesus, who lived and taught the gifts of gratitude, wonder, joy, and love. Always love. Amen. People of God, receive this benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen.